Welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. Father, tonight we just come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you and praise you for what you've already done in this church service. God, it's so great to experience your presence and to lift you up, to praise you and to worship you, God. And Lord, we thank you, God, that we get to come into this house of God and be a part of something so great. Lord, it's an honor and a privilege. God, we love you, Lord. Lord, tonight as we open your word, we pray that you would open us up to receive, God. Open our eyes to see, our ears to hear. Open our hearts to understand, Father God. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. May it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. God, we ask that you give us the guidance, the direction, the vision, the wisdom that we need for each and every one of our individual lives. Lord, I pray that the people would not hear my word, but would hear your word, God. Things that I didn't even say, Lord, anoint your word and minister it to the hearts and lives of the people. God, we don't just ask this blessing on ourselves. Also, we would ask it upon all the churches that are preaching and teaching the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. Lord, there are brothers and sisters. We love them. We pray that you would bless them this night, especially those that are having a midweek service, God. We pray that they would have that same God encounter and that same revelation of the word as you give us tonight. Lord, we're all in agreement. We say out loud that, amen. Sorry, I almost got you to say the Inland Empire shall be saved. You know you were thinking it. (laughs) Praise God. I, I don't see one lady here. She, she was, uh, she's tell, told me a story. I don't see her, so I can tell this story. But I was sitting over here, and, uh, and I forget who was preaching, but they said, we all say with a great big shout. And she said, the imminent pu-! And she kind of shrunk back and <laughs> sat down. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Tonight, I, I want to bring a word from the book of Numbers. If you get your Bible and go with me to the book of Numbers, chapter number 14. The title of tonight's message is about speaking faith. Speaking faith. I want to launch out of some principles that we, we started out in last week. Last week, if you didn't get a hold of the message, it was brilliant. And there was more to that message than I think any of us knew. God was speaking some things and there were some amazing things. And so tonight, I want to expand and build and, and continue in that line of thinking about faith. Numbers chapter 13, uh, I'm having you turn to Numbers chapter 14, but in Numbers chapter 13, Israel is on the, on the border of the promised land. They're getting ready to go in and inhabit the promised land, going and getting ready to take the promised land. So here they are on the border. They're getting ready to go in, and, and, and they send spies into the land. Send out 12 spies, one from each of the tribes of Israel, the leaders, and they, and they go in. These spies go in. They, they take a look at the land. As they're looking at the land, they find out that it, everything's as God says it, it would be. That there are houses that they didn't build. There's vineyards that they didn't plant. It, it truly is an abundant land full of, of milk and honey, right? And, and, and they're charged to bring back some of the fruit. And so there, there's, there's these grape clusters that the Bible records that are so big, so massive, so heavy, that it took two of these spies to take a pole in between the two of them and hang the clusters of grapes on their backs and, and carry that big old cluster back to report it to the nation of Israel. I mean, this this is an amazing place. And God is promising the nation of Israel that this is your land. I'm going to give it to you. Just as I brought you out of the land of Egypt with miracles, signs, and wonders, just as I I, I stopped all their mouths, just as I showed my my strong, mighty arm, and, and as I brought you out with a great deliverance, now I'm going to bring you into this land. These people had seen the miracles of God. They had seen the plagues. They had seen the Red Sea parted. They'd seen provisions in the desert. They were eating the bread of angels, the manna from heaven. They were being fed supernaturally each and every day. Their their sandal straps didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They're walking in the supernatural and in the miraculous. But despite all this, when the spies come back and bring a report, 10 of them bring back an evil report. They say, yeah, the land is good. Yeah, the land's flowing with milk and honey. Yeah, there's, there's, it's, it's, everything's in order. Everything's the way that God said it would be. But there's giants in the land. And we, we saw the descendants of Anak. There. Anak was this big, you know, mighty warrior. And his descendants, they're, they're big. They're giants. We're going to be like grasshoppers in their eyes. Only two of the spies brought back a good report. They said, no, we, it, it, we can do it. Come on, let's go in there. Let's take the land. If God is for us, come on, we, we, we got this. Just like God brought us out of Egypt, now God's going to send us into the promised land. If God delights in us, then he'll bring us in. 
And yet the people listened to the evil report. They listened to those 10 spies and their hearts melted and they started to complain. They started to say, oh, woe is us. They started to say, it would have been better for us to have died in Egypt. Let's take a look at it in Numbers chapter 14, verse number 2. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 2. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them. Now, I want you to notice that they said something. They spoke something. Talking about speaking faith tonight. This is what they spoke. The whole congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Egypt. Or if only we had died in this wilderness. So they're not giving too many options here with their words. They said, either we, we wish we could have either died in Egypt, which didn't happen, or we wish we would have died in the wilderness. If only. If only we would have died. If only we would have died in Egypt, if only we would have died in the wilderness, but not here, not going into the promised land, not when we're so close. If only we had died in one of those two other places. Now, Moses intercedes on behalf of the people. Moses goes before the Lord, and, and we're going to read through what Moses said to the Lord. But I want you to notice when we get down to the end of this section that we're going to read what God's response is to Moses. It, it, it's just mind-blowing when you take a look at what, what's taking place. Numbers chapter 14, drop down to verse number 17. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 17, we're going to read through verse number 20. Moses is speaking, and he's, he says to the Lord, And now I pray, let the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken, saying... Now, all of a sudden, Moses starts recounting to the Lord what the Lord had already spoken to Moses about himself. Are you listening? So basically, all that Moses is doing is Moses is praying and Moses is remembering what God has said about himself. And so Moses says, now, Lord, I pray, the power of my Lord be great, just as you have spoken. God, these are your words. And what did he say? Verse 18, saying, the Lord is long-suffering and abundant in mercy. Forgiving iniquity and transgression, but he by no means clears the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation. Verse number 19, pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now, so Moses intercedes for the people. He says, Lord, I know you want to wipe these people out. I know that you wanted to, to make a greater nation out of me, but Lord, what is the nation of Egypt going to say when they, when they see that we, we, we just got wiped out? They're going to say the Lord wasn't strong enough to bring them in. And so now he's praying to the Lord, and he says, Lord, you said you were full of mercy. You said that you forgave sin. And therefore, Lord, I pray that you pardon this people's sin. Pardon them, Lord, according to the greatness of your mercy. So he points out, Lord, you said you were merciful. Now, according to your mercy, I pray that you would pardon them, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Verse number 20. This is where I wanted to get to tonight. Verse number 20. Take a look at the Lord's response to Moses. Then the Lord said, I have pardoned according to your word. Stop and think about that for a second. Moses brought back up the word of the Lord to God. These were not Moses' words. These were God's word about himself. And he brought it up to God and he said, God, I want you to forgive these people. I want you to have mercy upon these people according to your great mercy, Lord. You've forgiven them from Egypt all the way till now. And Lord, I pray that you do it again. God says, I have pardoned according to your word. In other words, if Moses hadn't have prayed, hadn't have brought it up to God, hadn't have remembered the word of the Lord and spoke it forth from his mouth, then there would have been no intercession made and the people would have been wiped out. But God said, Moses, because you did this, according to your word, I'll pardon them. Now, this is a positive example of the power of our words when we speak faith. Now, let's take a look at it in the negative. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 28. Even though the Lord forgave them, there was still a consequence to their action. Numbers chapter 14, verse number 28. God is speaking, and he wants Moses to speak to the people. Numbers chapter 14, verse 28. The Lord says, say to them, Moses, speak to the people of Israel. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, 
so will I do to you. So just as there was a positive example, I have pardoned them according to your word. Now here comes the negative example. Say to them as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. Meaning, you said it would have been okay for you to die in the wilderness. You said it, and now you have it. Think about that. We've got a positive and a negative example right there in front of us. Last week, we heard the statement said that whatever train you are on, that is where you will go. So are you on the train of faith, believing God? Are you on the train of destiny, purpose, of goodness? Or are you on the train of grumbling, complaining, saying things that you don't really mean, but you're saying them anyways because you're mad, because you're provoked? Whatever train you are on, that's where you're going to end up. Why? Because here's two examples out of the word in just one chapter that the Lord says, according to your word, and as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The power of our words is so important for us to understand. And tonight I want to take a look at some things out of this chapter. Just some principles. I know sometimes we have a one, two, three. We've got a, you know, this is how to do it. This is what we need to do. But tonight I just want to bring some thoughts out of the word tonight. For you and I, that as we get a hold of these things tonight, it will help us to stay in faith and to speak faith and to stay in those positive areas where the word of God will come into effect in our life. A lot of times people say, I, I, I want the blessings, I want the promise of God, I, I, I want to have a good life, I want to have a good marriage, I want to be successful in my business, I don't want to be broke down, busted and disgusted any longer, I've been there long enough, and now I, I, I desire something, that's why you're here tonight, because you wanted to hear from God. Now God is speaking to you and I, and he's saying something to us about the power of our tongue, the power of our words, and that God listens to our words, and then he gives us what came out of us. So tonight, a couple of things. First thought for tonight is that our words work in the positive and the negative. Our words work in the positive and in the negative. Now, we saw two examples. In the positive, Moses is interceding for the people. This is a positive example. This is something that's good. Good for the people, good for God. Why? Because Moses is bringing it up to God, bringing up his word, declaring the faithfulness of God, the mercy of God, the, the, the long-suffering of God, the forgiveness of God. And as he declares it, that was God's desire. God wanted to do that. God is not waiting to wipe people out. That's not the character of God. No, God does not want that. God wants to bring the people into the promised land. So here's Moses interceding, and now the power of his words has a positive result. The Lord forgives them. The Lord has mercy on them. But in the negative, we also saw that the people had complained. The people said, we wish we could have died in the wilderness. And God says, as you've spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. He gave them the desire of their heart that was spoken from their mouth. It works in the positive and in the negative. Kind of an a, a interesting little verse in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 30. Turn there with me. Proverbs chapter 30. We're going to take a look at verse number 32. Talking about our words work in the positive and in the negative. Once again, this is a negative example, but you and I can learn from this negative, negative example what to do in the positive. Proverbs chapter 30, verse number 32 says, If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil. Now, so far in this verse, nothing's been spoken. So far. So all of this stuff is going on on the inside of a person. This is the train that they are on. This is where they are headed. If you have been foolish in exalting yourself, or if you have devised evil, if you've thought about evil, if you've been planning evil, take a look at what it says to do. Put your hand on your mouth. Isn't that interesting? Why is that? Because as you have spoken, so I will do to you. According to your word. So if there's negative things going on on the inside of you, this is the posture that you're supposed to have. Right. 
Why? Because if those evil thoughts and evil intents start to come out of your mouth, that's the train that you're on and that's where you're headed. That's where you're going. Sometimes people wake up and they say, oh, this is a terrible day. Wish I could have got more sleep. I didn't sleep all night. Oh, I'm probably going to just be hurting all day long. I've got a headache that won't go away. They open up the window, they look outside, and they say, oh, it's ugly. God, gray. This is the worst, and now I have to go to work where my boss is just going to hound me all day long. Guy in the cube next to me is going to be making weird noises and looking at me. just going to be a terrible day. You know what ends up happening? They have a terrible day. Why? Because according to your word, as you have spoken, uh, I will do to you. That was the train that they were on and that's where they arrived. And then at the end of the day, they throw their hands up in the air and say, see, I told you. I knew it. Maybe today will be better, but I don't think so. Just going to be a bad week. That's why I'm allergic to negative people, because I don't want to get on that train. I don't want to go there. I like what Matthew Henry wrote about this subject. He said, we must keep the evil thought that we have conceived in our minds from breaking out in any evil speeches. Do not give the evil thought a license. In other words, don't let it drive you around and take you where you don't want to go. Do not allow it to be published. That's an interesting way of saying it. But lay your hand on your mouth. Use a holy violence with yourself if need be. It's bad to think ill, but it's much worse to speak it, for that implies a consent to the evil thought and a willingness to infect others with it. Oh, my. Oh, my. That, that means that you've now consented to it. You've agreed with it by putting the power of your tongue behind it. And additionally, now you want to infect others with it. You know the old saying, misery loves what? <laughs> Company, right? And you can see those people coming a mile away. They just look like they've been sucking on lemons and they just want to walk up to you and they want to share their misery with you. It's almost like somebody's walking around saying, I really have to throw up. Can I throw up on you? <laughs> Most of the time before we can say no, bleh. Sometimes they don't even ask permission, right? Just walk up behind you. You're sitting at your desk at work. Bleh. There it is. <laughs> now they've infected somebody else with it. A lot of times gossip's like that. One person gets something on the inside of them, starts thinking about it. What did they mean by that? Wait, wait. Are they saying what I think they're saying? And all of a sudden, they start to speak about it, right? And they start to infect somebody else. Did you hear what they said, oh, it wasn't what they said, it was how they said it. I know that they were mad at me. And all of a sudden, here it goes, here it goes. It's going all around, and now other people, hey, you know, I think you're right. You know, if I was you, and now all of a sudden it started. It's on, Amen. and on and on and on. That's the negative example, but once again, the word exhorts us to speak the positive. Turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. You guys doing okay with this? Yeah. Praise God. Amen. Ephesians chapter number 4, one of, one of my favorite verses talking about our words. Ephesians chapter number 4, verse number 29 We just heard to clap your hand over your mouth if there's evil going on on the inside so you don't speak it. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. How do you do that? Well, put the hand over the mouth. But, or in other words, that's a negative example. Here's the positive example. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. Think about that for a second. It's necessary to edify other people. What does edification mean? Well, we get our word edifice from it. It means to build up. It, it means to strengthen the structure so that it can be raised. That is an 
edifice. It, it, it's something that is built up. It, it, it's strong enough to raise up to that height and to that level. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. It is necessary that we edify one another. Why is that? Because not only do you have the devil that hates your guts, that's putting all sorts of thoughts in your mind, not only do you have the world systems that the devil set up that are working against you, and we live in a fallen world and things are collapsing and constantly going down, but also you got to deal with the flesh, and the flesh is warring against the spirit, and the spirit warring against the flesh. I mean, you've got three enemies right there of your soul coming against you each and every day. It is necessary that we build one another up, necessary that we encourage one another. We can't be tearing each other down. Why? Because everything else is trying to tear us down. And so we got to build each other up. When you see somebody at church, good to see you. I'm glad you're here. Man, you look good. I saw my brother Martin. Where's my brother Martin at? Brother Martin over here, he was wearing this sweater the other day. I said, Martin, you look like you hit a sale at the Gap, my friend. You look good. And you know Martin stood up a little taller? Why are you laughing? That's not funny. I love my brother Martin. Martin's great. But what happened is he, he stood up a little taller. Why? He was edified. He was built up on the inside. Big smile on his face. See, it, it doesn't take much. It just takes opening your mouth and speaking something to somebody. Look at the last part of the verse. That it may impart grace... To the hearers. That means that when you speak a good word out of your mouth and you build someone else up, it imparts something. It, it, it gives away something. It, 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 it implants something on the inside of them. What is it? It's grace. God's sovereign divine ability to get the job done on your behalf when you can't do it. When you start to say what God would say and start to speak the word of God and start to tell people, hey, you're more than a conqueror. You can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. You, you know what? If God be for you, who can be against you? When you start to say that... It starts to impart and starts to build up and starts to empower people to live the God kind of life. That's why it says don't let any corrupt word. You know what corrupt is? Something that, that, that's tainted, something that, that is, is weak, something that's going to break down, something that's going to corrode and eventually bring the structure down. Don't let those things proceed out of your mouth, but rather what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace, the ability of God, on our behalf when we can't do it to the hearers. Our words work in the positive and the negative. Second thought for tonight is that our words reflect our heart and guide our life. We can see all this in the Word. Listen, none of this is coming out of like some book other than the Bible. That's the only book that I studied for this message. This is coming out of the Bible. This is not some sort of positive thinking message and you can have what you say, you know, and you create your own world and this and that. No, there, there are elements of truth in, in, in those things, but we're talking about what the Bible has to say. The Bible says that our words reflect our heart and guide our life. Let's take a look at it. Reflect our heart. Luke chapter 6. You're there in Ephesians. Turn back with me to the Gospel of Luke chapter number 6. Talking about how our words reflect our, our heart. Luke chapter number 6. Luke chapter number 6, verse number 45. Luke chapter number 6, verse 45 says this. It says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good. So stop for a second. Good man, good treasure in his heart brings forth good. Good. And an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. Okay, so you have an evil man with evil treasure where? In his heart, brings forth evil. Now take a look at the next sentence. How did they bring it forth? This is how. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. That means that whether... There's good or evil in your heart. The reflection of that heart is going to be what your words say. You cannot tell if people are good or bad just by looking at them. Can't tell if they're good or evil. But you can listen to their words and you can tell right away. Why? Because a good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth 
Good, for out of the abundance of his heart, out of the abundance of that goodness in his heart, his mouth speaks. But an evil man, out of the evil treasure of his heart, brings forth evil. Why? Because out of the abundance of his evil heart, his mouth speaks. Your words reflect your heart. Um, I'll just put it up on the overhead. Proverbs chapter 16, verse number 23. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. Wow. What does that mean? That means that your heart is teaching your mouth. In, in other words, your mouth isn't going to go off on its own. It's only going to say what it's instructed to by your heart. So whatever is poured into your heart is what's going to come out of your mouth. The heart of the wise teaches his mouth and adds learning to his lips. When you speak, whatever's going on on the inside of you will be reflected in your words. How about uh, guiding our life? Our words reflect our heart and guide our life. Uh, you're there in the book of Luke. Turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Talking about our words reflect our heart and guide our life. Romans chapter 10, verse number 10. If it guides our life, it guides every area. Is that correct? Okay, it's okay to talk to me. If it, if, it, if it guides our life, it guides every area. Is that correct? Yes. yes. So that, that also would, would pertain to salvation? Yes. Uh, come on. Come on. Does it, does it pertain to salvation? Yes. Okay. Let me show you the scripture that backs that up. Romans chapter 10, verse number 10. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness. There's faith. And you believe in your heart unto righteousness. But look at this. And with the mouth... Confession is made unto salvation. So what's coming out of your mouth started as a belief in your heart. With the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's how you got saved, is you believed in your heart, and you confessed with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, and you were saved. Right? When you said yes to Jesus, gave him all of your heart and all of your life, what did you do? You prayed a prayer and you confessed, Lord, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for me. He, he, he paid the price for my sins and now he forgives me of all my sins, washes me clean with his blood. What is that? That's your confession. That is your mouth guiding your life in the area of salvation. Turn with me to the book of James chapter 3, talking about our words guide our life. So it starts in the heart. The reflection of the heart is what comes out of your mouth, and then what comes out of your mouth guides your life. James chapter 3, starting in verse number 2. Right after the book of Hebrews is the book of James. James chapter 3, starting in verse number 2, we're going to read through verse number 5. James chapter 3, verse number 2 says, For we all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So he says, listen, none of us is without faults. We all stumble in many things. But if anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. Perfect meaning complete. Perfect meaning fully supplied. Perfect meaning having everything that you need. You are a perfect man. Right? Because we know that as long as we live in the flesh, that there's a flaw going on. There's that sin nature in the flesh. But in, in the spirit, we are perfected, right? We are born again, and now we are with Jesus Christ, seated with him in heavenly places. So there's a dual reality going on. But it's not talking about that. It's talking about our life, guiding our life, where we all stumble in many things, right? We go through this life, and there are things that take place, and we stumble. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man. He's complete. He's not lacking. He's got what he needs. Able also to bridle the whole body. Well, let's take a look at this example. He just used the term bridle. And then he goes on to say this. Verse number three. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body. So he just gives an example of a horse. And he says we put a bit, this little thing about this long, into the mouth of the horse. As we put that bit into the horse's mouth, then we're driving the horse, and we can make this massive horse that's bigger than us, that we couldn't pick up and turn by ourselves. Now all we got to do is go like this, and the horse turns. Why? Because there's something 
bridling the mouth. And if you get a hold of the mouth, then you get a hold of the whole body. You can steer the course. You can turn. What does he say? He uses a, a term, that they may obey us. So our body, this flesh suit that we live in, needs to obey us. How do we do that? We've got to bridle the tongue. We've got to put a bit in our own mouth, and that way we can turn it wherever we want it to go. Okay, here's another example, verse number four. Look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. So whoever's at the wheel, wherever they want to go, it doesn't matter what kind of storm is going on, what kind of wind is beating at it. If the pilot says we're going left and starts to turn that wheel, then what happens? The rudder on the back starts to turn and that ship starts to move in that direction. If he says, I want to go right and starts to turn that wheel, what happens? It turns and it starts to make that course. Why? Because the pilot had a desire and he turned it in that direction and that rudder just made a small adjustment and it turned the whole ship. Let me tell you something, church. doesn't matter what kind of storm is going on in your life right now. The devil made me do it is not a good excuse. Hopefully we learn that as children. But we continue to put excuses out there. Well, it was hard. Well, but, but, but you know, I'm weak. My, my daddy was this way. My mommy was this way. My whole family's this way. This is the way that we were raised. We're in San Bernardino. It's tough times right now. It's recession. I, I had people screaming at me. The kids were on my back. My wife, my husband, they, they, they were chewing me up and down. You, you don't know what it's like for me. There's a storm raging. Everything is crumbling all around me. You don't know what it's like around me. I don't, but God does. And God says it doesn't matter how fierce the wind is. If you can get a hold of your mouth, get a hold of your tongue, then you can start to steer yourself in the direction that God wants you to go. Sometimes people say, well, why doesn't, you know, if, 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 if I'm Jesus' co-pilot, then why doesn't Jesus turn the wheel where he wants it to go? No, Jesus is our captain. He's the captain of our salvation. He's calling the shots, but you've got a hold of the wheel. He's not going to move your mouth for you. You have to move your mouth. You have to speak. You have to pray. You have to intercede. You have to get a hold of it. You have to turn it. You have to start to move the direction wherever you desire. That's why it says wherever the pilot desires. Problem is we've got our desires wrapped up in the wrong thing. Our heart is now contrary to the ways of God, evil, and we start to bring forth evil and we turn in the wrong direction. But when you get a hold of the word of God and you get the goodness of God, there's none good but God. The word is good. When you start to get that good treasure in your heart and you start to bring forth that good treasure, you start to speak it and your desire lines up with the desire of God, then you start to turn in the direction of God. <laughs> Verse number five, even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Remember, this works in the negative as well as the positive. A lot of times we hear about the negative example, forest fire. That's a bad thing. Wow, gossip, you know, just a little bit of gossip, and all of a sudden, great big forest fire. A little, little bit of slander, a little bit of malice, a little bit of dirt thrown mudsling, and all of a sudden, it's all over everybody, right? But in the same way, fire is also a good thing. You know, the Holy Spirit came as fire. Our God is a consuming fire. There's a, a fire of the Holy Spirit on the inside of us, and God wants to catch this valley on fire. What? With a little spark, with a little shout. And it only takes a spark to get a little fire kindled, and we can get this thing lit up. We can get this thing heated up. How? By turning the wheel in the direction of God. We can, we can start to speak the word of God and the will of God in our life and start to turn the ship. Are you listening? Most of the time, what we speak is based on our need. Think about that for a second. Most of the time, what we speak is based on our need. So, you know, a lot of times people have a problem and, and a need arises. I need peace, right? My, my life is chaotic. There's a need. 
And so we start to speak. God, it's just chaotic all the time. I just can't get away. What, what is this? The negative starts to come out, right? We see the need and we start to speak. We start to react. We, we see something come up and rather than respond, we react, right? We get hit with something and pff, something starts to come out. And so we start to speak according to our need. But God wants us to know, and this is the last thought for tonight, that for every need, there is a seed. For every need, there is a seed. You, you see, the, the word in the Bible is pictured as a seed. Parable of the sower. The sower goes forth and he sows the what? Seed. The seed is likened to the word, right? Sower goes forth and he sows the word. And so we know that there is a seed of the word. And what happens to that seed? It falls on ground, falls on the heart. It starts here in the heart. And then it starts to take root and it starts to develop and it starts to come up. Now there's pressures. There's, there's the sun that's going to come up every day. There's the tribulation and the persecution that's going to come up in life. comes up every day. But if it's got a good soil, if it's got a good root, and if there's no rocks, no stony ground, no thistles, no thorns, cares of this life, desire for other things, if it's got a good place to get root, then it's going to start to spring up and it's going to produce fruit. You know how it produces fruit? Right here. The fruit of our lips, thanksgiving unto God. And so... For you and I, when we see the need come up in our life, when we start to see, man, I really need peace, then it's time to go get the seed. We see there's a lack. I have a need. There's a need of finances. Well, there's a seed. My marriage, struggling. We're not connecting. We're not communicating. There's a seed. Think about it. If we didn't have grocery stores, but we had seed stores, we would understand this principle a lot better. Am I right? Because no longer would you be going, oh, I'm just going to go down and grab a bag of salad. We'll rip it open and, and, and have salad, right? Doesn't work like that anymore. No, now you have to go and get seed. And you're going to have to sit there and take a look at all these packages and say, well, you know, I don't know if I like that, that butter lettuce stuff. Maybe I'm an iceberg guy, you know? I don't know if I really like that romaine, you know? Maybe, maybe, maybe I like spinach. And now all of a sudden, according to the need, according to what your desire is, you're going to have to select the right seed, and then you're going to have to plant that seed. And then start to cultivate it. Meditate on it. I like what Jack Hayford said. He said, faith that speaks is first a faith that seeks. You say, Pastor, you're rhyming now. Yeah, I am. <laughs> Why? Because you're going to remember it. For every need there is a seed. Faith that speaks is first faith that seeks. That means that before we plant a seed, we have to get it. you got to get a hold of the seed. If you want carrots in your salad, you got to go get carrot seeds. If you like a salad with some apples in it, you got to go get some apple seeds. And listen, it's not like going to the store and getting a bag. You have to wait for the plant to grow. Sometimes you have to wait for the season. Sometimes you have to pull some weeds. Sometimes you have to cultivate the soil. Sometimes you have to put it in the right place in your yard. It's not overnight always. So you've got to get a hold of the seed. You've got to plant the seed. You've got to start to seek it out. You've got to find the right one for your situation. Got to identify where it is that you want to go. What is your desire? Do you desire to have a good life? Do you desire to have a good marriage? Do you desire to be successful in your business? Do you desire to have kids that grow up and serve the Lord and don't make the same mistakes that you made when you were their age? If that is your desire, then you've got to go to the store and you've got to get a hold of the seed and you've got to grab a hold of that seed and you've got to start to sow the seed. You've got to start to plant the seed. You've got to cultivate the seed. Why? Because for every need, there is a seed. So you and I got to grab a hold of the promise of God. And if you don't know what the word says, you're not going to get the results you want. Your desire will be in the wrong place. And as the pilot of your life, you're going to steer it in the wrong direction. Why? Because according to your word 
And as you have, you have spoken, I will give it to you. Our faith, just like our love, is expressed in the same way, in word and in action. Think about that for a second. Our faith and our love are expressed in the same way, in our words and in our actions. Okay, for love. How do we express love? Well, we say it, I love you, in our words. How else do we express it? In our actions. Yesterday, people bought as many cards as will be sold all year, probably in one day. Millions of flowers were bought and given away. Millions of chocolates were given out. Gifts were given. What is that? That is a deed. Our love is expressed in words and in deeds. In the same way, our faith is expressed in words and in deeds. When you start to speak the promises of God, when you start to declare what you're believing God for, when you get a hold of a promise and you find the seed for your need and you start to declare it, that is how your faith is expressed in word and also in deed. There, that means that you don't just sit around and do nothing. You don't sit on your hands and hope that it comes to pass. No, you get involved in it. You do what the Word says. You start to get, get going with it. Whatever I can do, Lord, God, I'm going I'm to give you something to work with here, Lord. I'm going to be diligent about it because you said the diligent hand shall rule. God, I want to rule and reign in life. God, I want the promise, so therefore, Lord, I'm going after it. You want to have a healthy marriage? Get the Scripture on marriage. Start to declare the Word on marriage. Start to speak the things that God says about your marriage. My marriage will be a picture of Christ in the church. I, I will be a husband that loves his wife as Christ loved the church. I, I will be a wife that sub is submitted to her husband as the church is subject to Christ in everything. You start to declare, you get a hold of the seed, and you start to sow that seed, but then you put the action behind it. <laughs> then you tell your wife you love her. You tell your husband you love him. You start to lay down your life and start to sacrificially give to your wife because why? Because Christ laid down his life. He didn't come to be served, but to serve. And then as the woman, you start to submit to your husband. You start to reverence and respect him. Men are looking for respect. You tell a man you love him, he says, thanks. You tell him you respect him, you got him. That's how men are built. Tell a woman you respect her, she says, thanks. Tell a woman you love her, you got her. Second Corinthians chapter number four. Second Corinthians chapter four. We'll end with this tonight. Second Corinthians chapter number four. Great verse. You got it in your Bible? Second Corinthians chapter four, verse 13. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed, and therefore I spoke. We also believe, and therefore speak. Now notice that it says, according to what is written. We started this out with a positive example about Moses. What did Moses do? Moses heard the word of the Lord, what God had said about himself, went before God, and interceded on behalf of the people, and said, Lord, according to your mercy, according to your word, really, what God had already said about himself. And he brought that up to the Lord, and the Lord said, according to your word. What happened? Moses got it on the inside of him that God was gracious, that God was merciful, that God was forgiving, that God was all who he says he was. He got that on the inside of him, and it became a part of him so that when he spoke... Now the Lord looked at him and said, according to your word, you have a desire that lines up with my desire, and therefore I can move on that, Moses. According to your word. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, there's the seed. I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. You've got to act on the word. You've got to speak it out of your mouth. And you got to do it. Amen. Three things. Three things tonight that we learned that we saw. Some principles that we pulled out. Number one thing that we learned tonight is we learned that 
Our words reflect our heart, and they guide our life, that this works in the positive and the negative. And therefore, whatever's positive in our life, we can speak what's positive or we can speak what's negative. Second thing is that our words reflect our heart, and they guide our life. Whatever's on the inside of us is going to come out of our mouth. It's going to reflect in our words, and then our words also guide our life. Whatever train we're on, that's where we're going to go. So whatever's on the inside of us, if we're speaking it, it's going to direct our lives. Finally, we learn that for every need, there is a seed. We believe, therefore, we speak. If you got something from the word of the Lord tonight, come on, give him a great big praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. I would encourage you, if you're going through something tonight, if you got a situation, go and find a scripture. There's some great tools, great resources. Some of you in the back of your Bible have a concordance. Man, sometimes if you're dealing with something like, let's say, anger, you can just go to A, look up anger, okay? If you want to learn about money, look up M, go find out about money, that sort of a thing. Also, there's some great websites out there that you can get a hold of and uh, some great things that you can take a look at. Um, Bible Gateway, Blue Letter Bible, you can just type in a word and it'll bring up all the scriptures that have that word in it. Kind of a neat thing. So I would encourage you guys, Whatever your need is, get a hold of a scripture and start to speak it out of your mouth. Speak faith about it and then get to work on it. Amen? Ladies, you guys are going to have a great time tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m. My favorite preacher is preaching tomorrow, and that's the Holy Spirit through my wife, Jess. And she's just wonderful, and she's got a great message. I got to look over her notes and tell her, honey, that's good. So uh, God's, God's got something in store for you guys tomorrow. I believe you're going to be encouraged. So ladies, be sure to get there. And also, I uh, just want to give a shout out for our youth. They started their series tonight on uh, amnesia. You notice they had that up on the overheads too. And so the youth started that this week. And so, man, get your teenagers over there and invite some friends. Give a shout out. God's good to us. Hey, I want to talk to you guys before you leave. I'll let you go in a couple minutes. But let's talk for a moment. Just pay attention for a second. Give me, give me your attention. Just, just drown out all other distractions right now. Turn off your cell phone. God wants to speak to your life. You guys were great tonight. We had a great time singing and praising God, worshiping him. Tonight, some of you guys came forward to the altars and and really gave some things to God. There were some tears up here at the altar tonight. I believe you had a connection with God. You guys were great listening to the word. We laughed and we we learned some things and and got encouraged in some areas. Let's not stop there. We want to make sure that before you leave this place that your heart is right with God. Because if you walk out of this place and you die and your heart's not right with God and you, you, you die, that's it. Then you're not going to make it. You say, what are you talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. Your heart's not right with God. You're on your way to hell. Don't you think it's time that somebody stopped playing games, loved you enough, respected you enough, and honored you enough to tell you the truth? Well, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough tonight to tell you the truth. If you die and your heart's not right with God, you're not going to go to heaven you're going to end up in hell. And God forbid that should happen to anyone. That's not the plan or the will of God. God loves you. God wants you to be with him. A lot of times people say, well, you know, you get there your way, I'll get there my way. All roads lead to heaven. We'll do our own thing and we'll all get there the same way. No, listen, not all roads lead to heaven any more than all roads lead to the moon. Only one specific way you're going to get there and it's not just by doing it your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee way. You can only get to heaven one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. That means that it's God's heaven and we got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, oh, that's good news because I've been a good person. Done a lot of good things in my life. Gave money to charities. Helped my neighbors out. Been been really nice to people in the community. And and I used to be bad, but I changed my behavior. Now I'm good. And and I'm going to go to heaven because God lets good people into heaven. The problem with that thinking is that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you are a good person, do good deeds, give money to charity, help people out, are nice to your neighbors, that you get to go to heaven. There's no grading scale in the back of the Bible or some curve that you have to be above. You be this good and you get to heaven. Why? Because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, well, his name is Jesus. So you're not going to get there just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, I was raised in church. Parents took me to church as a child, told me we were Christians, had me baptized or christened as a child. They hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck, took you to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school. And, and you were born in America. America is a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindu. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, right? Wrong. Huh. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you're raised in church, parents call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. 
Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you attend religious classes, wear religious jewelry, be baptized or Christian as a child, that that qualifies you for heaven. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that it says that because you're not some other religion or that because you're born in America, that that gets you right with God, headed for heaven and denying hell. That's how you think you're going to make it. You're not. And I love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you would say, well, pastor, hold on a second, because not only when I was a child did I go to church, but here I am sitting in church right now, and I consider myself to be a Christian. But again, could you show that to me in the Bible where you sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian? It's not there. Any more than you can go sit in a lake, call yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. It doesn't work like that. Can't sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Some of you would say, but, but wait a second, not only have I attended church, my last church I got involved. I helped out, sang in the choir, carried the pastor's Bible. I made decisions in that church, and people thought of me as a leader. I even got a membership card to that church. Once again, that's great. I'm glad you did those things, but could you show that to me in the Bible where you help out, carry the pastor's Bible, sing in the choir, make decisions? People think of you as a leader that you get to go to heaven. It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible do I see God is waiting, looking for your membership card to a church when you enter the gates of heaven. It doesn't work like that. Come on, tonight. Let's love you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you say, but... But hold on, someone told me that if I knew God, that makes me a Christian. I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection, celebrate Christmas every year of my life and sing the songs. I could quote scriptures to you and tell you stories from the Old and New Testament. That's, that's awesome. I'm glad you can do those things. But have you read your Bible? You know, the Bible says that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible says the devil himself believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Quote scriptures in the Bible. Wow. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about what you have in your head. It's not about having some mental ascent towards God, having head knowledge about who God is, but rather this is about your heart. Jesus said it like this. He said, you must be born again. Now, I know that term has been ranked through the coals in our society, but this is not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. What does being born again really mean? Well, here's what it means. Beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. This is all or nothing with God. Let me prove it to you. In Revelation, the third chapter, Jesus is speaking. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you warm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what does he say? Well, what does lukewarm mean? Well, it means a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down, a little token prayer every now and then, a little church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's the condition of your heart, you're not going to make it. How do I know? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and vomited from the mouth of Jesus. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity, just like this. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three, just like that. When I say three, bang, I'm going to pop my hands together. When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to lift your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Dan, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Say, whoa, 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 wait a second. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Uh-huh, you might be. But get over it. Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever and ever? No one would make that trade. Jesus said it like this. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. I'm a man. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. It's your call, though, your choice. Because Jesus also said on the opposite end of that statement, if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, you choose. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Or will you sit there and do nothing when you know you need to get right with God? I've done my job. I've loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's already done everything he's going to do. He sent Jesus, beaten, bloody, hung on a cross. He died and was raised again to life. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Who should raise their hand in a moment if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place and you know that's the condition of your heart? Or finally, who should raise their hand if you've never done this? Hey, come on. You can get right with God in a safe and friendly place. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, if you're watching by television in the foyer, in the Love Rock Cafe, or on the live stream, come on. You can lift your hand right where you're at. I'm going to count to three, pop my hands together. This is your time 
This is your moment. Here we go. All together on the count of three. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four. Thank you. Five. Anybody else real quick? Five wise people already. Anybody else? Help me, ushers. Anybody else real quick? Five. Where you at? You got five wise people already. They're pointing down here. Thank you. There's six. Got you. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? You know you need to give God all your heart and all your life. Is there a hand? Anybody else real quick? About six wise people. Anybody else? I just want to give you a moment. Anybody else? If you're sitting there wondering if you should do this, you should. Come on, go for it. It's as simple as just raising your hand and saying, yes, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. Be headed for heaven to dying hell. Anybody else? Real quick. Anybody else on this side? Anybody else? Anybody in the middle over here, up on top? Thank you. Number seven. God bless you. Anybody else real quick? Where are you at? Number eight. Number eight, you're sitting there wondering if you should do this. Come on. Get your hand up. Number eight, anybody else? Anybody else? Is that a hand in the family room? Wave it at me if it is. No? All right. Praise God. I think we got about seven wise people. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. All seven of you, if you raised your hand, or if you're number eight, number nine, number ten, you should have raised your hand, but you didn't. Come on, it's not too late for you. Here's what I want you to do. If you raised your hand or you should have, once you get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, get a hold of a friend if you need a friend, I want you to get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies tonight, but we can't do that till we get you down here. So if that's you, you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, get your stuff, get a friend if you need a friend, get in the aisle and meet me up front right now. Let's stand and welcome them. You come right now. Just come on. Lord, I give you my heart. They're coming. Come on, let's give them a hand as they come. Give you you can come too. Soul. This is your time. This is your moment. And I live for you alone. Every breath that I take. If you need to come, just come Every on, make your way to the front right now. Lord, have your way in Come on, come on, you can come. Lord, this is your time. I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Hallelujah. They're still coming. Let's give them a hand. Come on, you can come too. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, everybody up front, put a big smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. Thank God you guys have come. All right? Right over here to my right, your left. This is my friend, Pastor Dave, with the blue scarf. Pastor Dave is not only a snazzy dresser. Pastor Dave is like the coolest guy in the place, okay? I, I know you were thinking, it's Pastor Dave, all right? <laughs> Pastor Dave is going to do three things with you. I'm going to let you know what they are in advance, okay? Number one thing he's going to do is just pray a simple prayer with you to invite Jesus into your heart, and you're going to be born again, okay? Second thing he's going to do, he's going to give you some free information, free literature that our pastor wrote that will help you to find out what to do next in your walk with God. It's easy reading, maybe a, a, a half hour, sit down one time and a half hour, invest into that and find out what to do next in your walk with God. Listen, you invest more time in television and movies and phone conversations with friends and things. You can just take a, a little moment, half hour, just to sit down and read about that. Find out what to do next in your walk with God. Final thing he's going to do is he's going to introduce you to a friend here that we call a spiritual personal trainer. Basically, it's just a friend in church who will help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. Now listen, None of us grew till we had someone come alongside of us and encourage us. That was that necessary edification we were talking about. And SPT is that person in your life who will speak good things into you and encourage you from the word of God, help you to find that seed that will grow into something strong and stable, build you up into a life with Jesus Christ. Okay, it's free. He'll describe how it works. If you guys will just make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right this way. Let's give him a hand. Hallelujah. Thank you.